Hello, welcome to the Hope and Healing Center. I'm so glad you all could make it to our program today on the autism family across the lifespan. Today, I'd like to welcome Kelly Williams and Mary Cooper, both with Chris Samaritan. Dr. Williams is a licensed clinical psychologist and the director of training and mind works testing at Chris Samaritan. She received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Argozi University in Washington, DC, and completed her internship at the May Institute in Boston, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at Children's Medical Center in Dallas. Throughout her training, Dr. Williams received extensive instruction in the evaluation and treatment of autism spectrum disorders. Mary Cooper is a speech language pathologist with Bay Area Speech, a division of Chris Samaritan. She has worked for over four decades with children and adolescents with communications disorders, ranging from articulation, language, and childhood apraxia of speech to autism spectrum disorders, including social skills. While most of her experience has been in the pub public school setting, Ms. Cooper currently sees clients at Crest. Please welcome Kelly and Mary. Glad to have you all today. Well, thank you for having us back. Um, last time we were here, we touched on early signs of autism and parental burnout, and today we're taking that and expanding it mm -hmm. um, quite a bit and going through the lifespan. Uh, better? <laughs> Is that better? Okay, good. Okay. Um, so a little bit more about us, um, and, I, and I share this on a personal level just so that you know where I'm coming from, not just from the professional side, but from the personal side as well, um, that not only do I work with the autism population almost exclusively in my practice, but I also live with it at home. Um, so I'm coming from a place of not just the clinical mind, but the mother in me as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I get very passionate about this topic. Um, and a little bit about Chris Samaritan, which, which we'll, we'll talk about. Here is our objectives. I forget we have this really cool clicker. Yeah. Um, so here's our objectives for today. Um, so learning the signs and symptoms of autism spectrum disorder, or ASD. Um, including the new criteria for DSM-5, since that is now the um, definition that we're using. The, um, identify the impact that it can have on the family system, recognizing the warning signs of parental burnout and safeguarding against parental burnout, um, and also identifying state and federally supported programs and learning of local resources for short and long-term care. So mm -hmm. we have a lot to cover today. Um, a little bit about Chris. Samaritan. We are a uh, quite a large nonprofit faith-based organization. Um, we serve the greater Houston area. So our mission is essentially to help um, those in need throughout greater Houston to attain emotional, mental, and spiritual health through quality counseling, education, and professional training programs. We seek to follow the example of Jesus in ministering to all, regardless of age, ethnicity, faith, or ability to pay. Um, we offer lots of services, counseling, um, testing services, psychiatric services. We have speech and language. Mm -hmm. We have Erlen screenings, and we also have a graduate and postgraduate level training program. Um, we do accept most insurances. We do have a sliding scale, and we are all over the place in Houston. Um, but our main multidisciplinary office is in the Clear Lake area. So um, we have a lot to offer at Crist, and that's kind of mm -hmm. who we are and where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to let Mary talk about autism, autism <laughs> which is one of my favorite subjects. Yes. I do not have a family connection to autism, but um, way back in the public, when I was still in the public schools, I remember one of my clients came in. Uh, he was a twin, and he had autism. His twin did not, but um, which just is a, a, a quirky thing. Mm -hmm. But I remember talking to a colleague who also worked with this young man, and I said to her, I don't know what it is, but all these little kids on the spectrum have a special place in my heart. And she said, Mary, that's obvious. So they, they do. That. They, they touch me in a special way. And before we go mm -hmm. on, I want to mention that uh, in the advance information, it was we had said that we would have a mom here, yes. Debbie Moon, who would be talking about um, 
the adult side of autism. Debbie's had a severe um, family issues. She's now caring for her brother who was in hospice. And so prayers for her family and mm -hmm. for her brother would be um, in order. So, okay, now we'll get on with what is autism spectrum disorder. The formal definition is persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction, which means that they're going to, if they talk, it could be stereotypical. They're going to talk about maybe one thing or I have a very limited range of conversational topics. And their social interaction is a little skewed as well. Uh, they don't get a lot of things. They don't get the social bubble. They don't get um, having to ask questions and answer questions and that. Well, you know, they understand what's going on. Why does everybody else not understand what's going on? Restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, and activity, and again, one thing. I remember when the Titanic, when the movie was, uh, was coming out, some place, some interviewer talked about a young man who worked with James Cameron. This kid, young adolescent, had a huge interest in the Titanic. He knew everything there was to know about the Titanic at that point in time, so he got to meet James Cameron and work with him on the movie. It was really, yeah, it was really pretty special. Um, and that's very typical of kids on the spectrum. They have one special interest and they will take it farther than you thought possible. Um, the symptoms must be present from um, in the early development period, but it might not show up as full-blown autism because the demands on the child aren't that great at that time, but it's there. Symptoms must cause a clinically significant impairment. They're not just quirky kids. There's something that's really getting in the way of their progress. And it can't be better explained by intellectual dif uh, disability or a global developmental delay, although it could be comorbid mm -hmm. with those other, in, uh, other types of problems. Severity level one through three, level one is requiring some support, level two requiring a substantial amount of uh, support, and of course level three requiring very substantial support. And there we've got the, the diagram. And the severity level, that is new to us for the DSM-5 definition mm -hmm. of autism. Before, that severity level wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, so that is new. And that is something, I think, new across the board as far as any sort of psychological or psychiatric mm -hmm. um, issue in terms of defining the severity in with regards to how much support they're going to need. That is very new for, for the field of psychology. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it's kind of a wait and see right now as far as what that's going to do mm -hmm. in terms of the children getting the services that they need and, and how they're going to get uh, go about getting those services. Um, so we'll kind of see what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, and today is October 1st, mm -hmm. uh, and the new codes go into effect today. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. More newness. Okay. Common experiences of individuals with ASD. Sensory issues, they might be hyposensitive or hypersensitive to lights. It might, they might not care if it's super bright or super dark, and other ones are going to be shading their eyes. Sounds, uh, you'll see a lot of these little kids running around with their, you know, holding their ears. Sometimes you can just put headsets, put a earphones on them so that it blocks out the noise. Smells, see a lot of them, they'll touch something and then they smell because they get all kinds, they get more information from it than the people, the neurotypicals do. Textures, they might feel something. Um, I've seen a lot of little kids with ASD who have a square of fabric that they keep with them because they like the texture and it helps calm them. Mm -hmm. Or they'll keep Velcro on their desk mm -hmm. or something like a zipper or something in their pockets that they can play with because mm -hmm. um, that, that relieves that that gives them some sense of calm right mm -hmm. or on the other hand of uh, clothing that they will not wear because they can't stand the feel of it yeah. jeans blue jeans heavy denim mm -mm, that's a, a no-no for some kids mm -hmm. wool sweaters which we don't have a lot of problem with here um, and they're not doing it so much anymore but the tags in the back of t-shirts mm -hmm. that they you have to used to have to cut those out mm -hmm. i worked with a woman another speech path who had sensory issues who said that the 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 print in the t-shirts mm -hmm. was worse than the labels, so she really hated that. She'd have to do something to mask that. Mm 
mm-hmm. because it really was very annoying to her. Mm-hmm. The lines, the toe lines in your socks mm-hmm. can be aggravating for some. They want the socks turned inside out because you just the feeling is different. Seam. Yeah. Um, on the inside, it's softer versus the outside. Uh-huh. Um, I've seen tags. I've seen, yeah, jeans are restrictive. Mm-hmm. The long sleeves won't wear long sleeves. So if, you know, it's winter and they're still out in shorts and short sleeves because they won't or can't mm-hmm. wear the longer, um, thicker clothing. And then the compression, the kids that need the compression yeah. that want the Under Armour compression shirts in mm-hmm. the middle of the summer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's... It's just a, a gamut. You run a gamut with these mm-hmm. kids with their sensory issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there are the picky diets. Um, when we were here before, somebody talked about the white diet with the kids that will eat nothing that is not white. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I have a granddaughter who was nowhere near spectrum, but she went through the white diet for a very long yes. time <laughs> as well. Yes. Lots uh, of carbs, lots of, mm-hmm. for whatever reason, are are our autism kiddos love carbs. <laughs> so mm-hmm. that's that white or that beige diet that mm-hmm. we talk about. They, they eat a lot of goldfish and McDonald's chicken nuggets and only McDonald's chicken nuggets. Mm-hmm. Or Chick-fil-A. Um, it doesn't matter, but it would have to be one or the other. Yeah. Um, you can get chicken nuggets at home and make them homemade, and it's not the same. It's got to be, um, as an example. Mm-hmm. Um, mashed potatoes. Loves mashed yeah. Mashed potatoes. And a lot of it's sensory texture kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um Sometimes different foods upset their tummies, and so they restrict. Mm-hmm. Um, but picky diets are really common. Very mm-hmm. common. So our sleeping ha- problems, sleeping habits. Some children um, have to be literally locked in a room at night so the parents can get some sleep because mm-hmm. the kids will be up all night long. They just don't have the same sleep requirements that mm-hmm. the rest of the population does. Uh, hypo or hyperactivity, they might just be very low tone and low activity as well. Poor attentional behavioral and emotional control. That's um, very typical. Some of these things you'll see in other issues as well. Uh, And there's a a video that we've got for a little bit later. A lot of the things that we see in kids with autism, you see also in other disabilities. But it's a qualitative difference mm-hmm. with our kids on the spectrum. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they the, the attention, it could be hyper-attention to one thing, like to a little piece of something on the floor, a little piece of the design in the, in the carpet, to the exclusion of everything else. So, yeah, that's the poor attention, but it's not, I- it's different from ADHD type all over the place attention, mm-hmm. which they may have as well. Yeah. Behavior, well, they're on their own schedule and Mm -hmm. so behavior is I don't think they do it to be bad they do it because that's the way they are and they are so tuned into their own bodies to the exclusion of everybody else that they behave to in ways that make them feel safe Mm -hmm. and the same with emotional control Uh, delayed adaptive skills the same kinds of things if you can't pay attention to what everybody else is paying attention to if you can't sit in a chair the way the rest of the class does, then you're not going to adapt well to a classroom. Um, gross and fine motor skills are going to be awkward. Most of these kids are not talented physically, mm. and they will have poor handwriting at best. Mm-hmm. Seizures up to 20% in ASD. And oftentimes those are petite mal or absent seizures, so you're not necessarily seeing, like if you if you think of seizures like the grand mal seizure where you see the shaking and all of that, um, oftentimes it's uh, you don't see them. And mm. for a lot of kids on the spectrum, they zone out or they look like they're zoned mm-hmm. out, and so that's one of those signs where you really want to be careful with. Is it zoning out because they're hyper-focusing on something or are they zoning out because it's an absent seizure that you're not seeing? Mm-hmm. Um, So one thing that I always recommend for all of my clients is to make sure that they're getting a neurological workup to make sure that there's no seizure activity going on, simply because that percentage is really high. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the zoning out, they can zone out for the sake of zoning out, just Mm -hmm. to tune everybody else out and go to their own happy place. Yeah, and there are times when that seems like a pretty good idea. Yes, ma'am. You skipped over uh, pizza. What is that? Oh. That's um, eating things that are not food, like paper or mm-hmm. dirt or yeah. chalk. 
Yeah, Pica. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I've I've had kids who will pick erasers up off the floor and, and mm -hmm. eat them as if they're food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these are these are kids that you have to be really careful with and really need um, some intensive behavioral treatment mm -hmm. to make sure that they don't ingest something that could be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. batteries, little batteries. Oh yeah, a little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then the numbers are on the rise. Um, children with ASD are now one in 68. And boys, it's now one in 42, which is scary. When you think of a public school classroom of 22 kids in elementary school, that's one child, one boy in almost every classroom, somewhere on the spectrum. So why? Well, that's what we're going to get to now. Mm -hmm. Speculation is about it because we don't really we don't know the cure or the the cause. Mm -hmm. There are things that we do know. There are biological and neurological differences mm -hmm. in the brains of children on the spectrum of people on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. You can check this. You can see it with MRI, magnetic resonance Im imaging, and mm -hmm. PET scans, positron emission tomography. Why is that happening? We don't know. Mm -hmm. These numbers are from 2014, so that is pre-DSM-5. So what the new definition is going to do, it could go up, it could go down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there is. In, in the cause, again, there's speculation about GMOs, there's speculation about pesticides, there's mm -hmm. speculation about vaccines, there's speculation about food. There's all kinds of speculations. Mm -hmm. The only thing that we do know at this point is that there are genetic markers. It does run in families. Um, and that the part of the brain, they a study came out just in the last year that identified they did autopsies on several children who had passed away who had autism. And so they did brain autopsies. And they looked at the uh, cerebellum, which is what this quote from the National Autism Center is referencing, that um, this part of the cerebellum, the, the layers are different than your and my brains. And that part of the cerebellum that where that starts to develop in utero is from our first trimester. So it's not something that happens way later. Mm -hmm. It's clearly something that's happening in utero. But why why the rise? Why don't know yet. Mm -mm. Don't know yet. So there's a lot of people out there working really hard trying to find it because that's a really staggering number mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we get into the early signs of ASD. Um, delayed communication. Now, this doesn't mean that every kid who doesn't talk until he's two is on the spectrum, but that is definitely one of the first things we look at. Uh, neutral facial tones. These are kids that don't show a lot of affect. Decreased use of communicative gestures. They're not going to point. They're not going to wave. And if you say, if you point and look at something, they are as likely to look at the end of your finger as they are at what you're pointing at. Uh, the decreased eye contact. Why this is, we don't know, but they tend not to look at face, pay attention to faces and especially to eyes. Mm -hmm. They typically don't respond to their names. Uh, they, as I said before with the attention thing, they will fix on something visually. Abnormal repetitive behaviors, everybody's familiar with the flapping and the, the finger gestures or things that they do. Uh, greater interest in objects than in people. Um, a lot of them will carry around toys, but then many toddlers get fixed on a special toy. The, the Samsung, uh, I think it's Samsung, a commercial recently where the man is running through the house, quick, quick, we've got to wash rabbit. What was it, a bat bunny? Bunny, b baby bunny took a something, got fruit juice or something on it, got to wash it quick, and the mom says, well, where's backup bunny? And he says, this is backup bunny. And it's funny because we can all relate to it. We've all had that thing. Mm -hmm. Then the child probably isn't on the spectrum. It's just going through that fixation of I've got to have my bunny with me. Okay. Uh, decreased imitation. These kids do not imitate typically. When we go to play patty cake, they're just there. And again, that goes in with play skills. If they're not going to imitate, they're probably not going to play real well. Mm -hmm. um, so the signs over here. 
no social smiling or, or babbling by six months. If they don't have a one-word communication by 16 months, uh, you know, really start thinking about this. And then two-word phrases by 24 months, go bye-bye, you know, daddy home, whatever. Uh, those are things to look at. No babbling or pointing by 12. Poor eye contact, 12 months, that is, not 12 years. <laughs> Heaven help us. Uh, or showing interest in, in uh, sharing. Unusual attachment to one object. Not responding to sounds, voices, or their names. Mm -hmm. Loss of skills at any time. And then, um, oh, this comes from the May Center for Evaluation and Treatment in Randolph, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Okay. So oftentimes when you see infants, there's, there are more and more studies coming out saying that we can diagnose younger than two. Um, the research is still sketchy on that, but mm -hmm. what they are seeing is, are some of these symptoms. Mm -hmm. So like the lack of eye contact and, and a baby who might be very flat and not smiling. So at six months, you should see that social smiling. Your baby should be smiling back at you when, when mm -hmm. you talk to them and you're giving them all the oohs and the ahs and the, you know, all the fun talk. Um, and if, if you're not seeing that, then that's something in the back of your mind that you're mm -hmm. saying, I'm, go I'm gonna watch this. It's not necessarily autism, but that's where the research is pointing to and all these little kind of different signs um, to say that, okay, I need, mm -hmm. I need to just monitor. Um, if you see a, an infant who seems very flat and by the time they're supposed to be talking and they're not, that's when you want to call someone like one mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. so. We have a, a video. It is about 10 minutes long, um, so it's going to feel long, but it, it's, it's a very good video. It comes from the um, Autism Center at Kennedy Krieger Institute, which is one of the premier centers in the country. Um, and it's from uh, Dr. Uh, Landa, who is really just showing typical child development versus autism development. So you can kind of see the difference mm -hmm. between the two. Okay. Shall we move? Okay. Okay. I'm Rebecca Landa, Director of the Center for Autism and Related Disorders at Kennedy Krieger Institute. You are about to watch a brief tutorial illustrating the early signs of autism spectrum disorders, or ASD. You will see three pairs of videos of one-year-olds. Within each pair, you will first see a child with neurotypical development, followed by a child who shows early signs of ASD. The developmental features indicative of ASD shown within these videos fall into three main categories. These include effective communication and sharing enjoyment, making social connections, and the one with which we will begin, using social opportunities through play. This 19-month-old child does not show signs of ASD. He has chosen to play with the balls. He quickly integrates the lady into his play. He pretends that the balls are food and offers a bite to the lady. him to learn new play skills and at the same time synchronize his actions with the actions of others. This 19 month old child shows signs of ASD. He has 
and gain entrance to inventory from. He does not share his enjoyment of the film with others. He does not look toward others and smile. to his ear, he does not show creative playing of the thumb. When his name is called, he does not respond. Elliot! 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 He does not offer the thumb to others so that they can have a turn. His mother tries to distract his attention away from the thumb. communicate with his mom to keep the social game going. This 14-month-old child has a mild mortgage illness that does not show signs of ASD. As he explores the new toys, he remains aware of the people nearby. He checks in with his mother behind him to ensure that she also sees the toy. Next, he shows that he understands the social communicative meaning of the woman's pointing gesture by immediately looking at the sticker. Then he looks over at another sticker she had pointed out before. He continues the woman's topic of communication as he points to the bigger sticker. He shows the motivation to maintain social engagement with others and the ability to communicate using coordinated gaze, vocalization, and gesture. This 14-month-old shows signs of ASD. First, he claps his hands while enjoying the bubbles. He does not share his enjoyment by looking at the man. does not respond to his opinion. Although he looks at the man's pointy finger, he does not follow the direction of the man's gesture to locate the object of the man's attention. This 14-month-old does not show signs of ASD. While she enjoys looking at and exploring the toy, she stays engaged with the people nearby. She tries to share her enjoyment with her mother as she turns to show the toy to her. Then, she shares her enjoyment with the lady across from her by directing her gaze and smile toward the lady. Also, she recognizes that the lady is a source of help. Her request for help is clear and effective. Coordinating eye contact, gesture, and vocalization for purposeful communication is a sign of healthy social and communication development. This 14-month-old child shows signs of ASD. Notice how his attention is so focused on the toy that he does not interact with the people nearby. He does not share his attention with others. His exploration of the toy is also unusual. He drops the toy onto the table and watches it move. When the toy stops moving, he does not use eye contact, vocalization, or gesture to ask for help. He also tenses his body and mouth in an unusual way. Even though the lady is talking to him, he shows no interest in her. He does not seem to understand that her gesture is an offer to help him. He does not check in with the lady or his mother to see whether they are paying attention to the toy that he is enjoying. ASD is a neurodevelopmental disorder affecting multiple aspects of development, especially social and communication skills. Children with ASD often show unusually intense interest in certain objects or sensory experiences. They may repeat certain behaviors over and over again. The signs of ASD are not transient, but rather persist over time. The earliest signs of ASD are often subtle and become 
questions about what you saw before we go forward? Comments? Comments? And those were little guys. Mm -hmm. Those were little mm -hmm. guys. Um, so those, when we do evaluations, those are the things that we're looking for. We're looking to see what their eye contact looks like. We're looking to see if I point to something outside, will they follow my gaze to that mm -hmm. thing? Will they follow my finger to that thing? If they point, do they point with their index finger? Or do they point with their whole hand? Or do they grab mm -hmm. and pull me to where they want me to go instead of showing me where they want me to go? Um, or trying to explain. Right, or telling, mm -hmm. using some sort of verbalization to say where they want me to go. Mm -hmm. Most parents really start, unless they are already engaging in a lot of stereotypical behaviors, so a lot of the hand flapping, the body tensing, um, tantrums. tantrums are another big thing. So it's either the stereotypical stuff or it's the meltdowns and the tantrums that are in the, where their child is inconsolable and it can last for hours and they don't know how to calm them. That's usually one of the two reasons. Um, other than that, it's they're two, they're three, they're, they're not talking or they're not talking as much as they should, um, or they're in daycare or Mother's Day out and they're not connecting with other children, that's usually mm -hmm. when they, they start to be seen. But the research is pointing into the area of you can see the signs much earlier. Mm -hmm. It's just not as present, not as obvious to the parent or to the, to the lay person, if you will, um, until they're a little bit older. Yeah, They're mm -hmm. very subtle. They uh -huh. are very subtle. Yes, ma'am. It just, it seems like a lot of this early currently uh, program is based, it's aimed towards children on the lower end of autism mm -hmm. spectrum. Is it more difficult to, um, to analyze or to diagnose, I guess is the right word, the children on the higher end? It is more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, the signs are more subtle, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times those children, they don't get diagnosed much later. And oftentimes the question is, do they have OCD? Mm -hmm. Or do they have ADHD? Mm -hmm. um, and so I get those questions a lot. And then once I get them to my office, I'm like, mm, there's, there's something more than that. But then I also get the reverse, where a parent swears up and down it is autism. And then I see them like, no, they're perfectly social. Mm -hmm. but they've got all these compulsive behaviors or their mm -hmm. executive functioning, so their ability to attend and to regulate their emotions is not as so great. Mm -hmm. So that might be more anxiety or ADHD. Mm -hmm. For little kids, um, for, our, for our little ones, um, anxiety, believe it or not, is something, you know, some babies are born just with an anxious temperament, and if you have an anxious parent, you tend to have an anxious child, and a lot of times they'll engage in those tantruming behaviors or they engage in those compulsive behaviors because compulsive behaviors are predictable. Routines are predictable. That brings me comfort. Mm -hmm. So they look like they might be on the spectrum, but they're really not. They just need that comfort because they have an anxious temperament. So that's, again, where that... Um, and we have in the next slide this MCHAT. Um, it's a free online screening tool. It's free. You can go and click on it, and it takes 10 seconds probably to fill it out. It's 20 yes or no questions. Um, and what it does is it, it tells you if you need to follow up. It's not saying, yes, your child's on the spectrum, because it can't do that. But it, it can say you might want to follow up with your pediatrician, um, because some of those signs may be there. Okay. Okay. 